Okay, welcome everybody. I hope uh, this new holiday edition of the Into the Impossible podcast uh, is finding everybody in good health and in good spirits and getting ready for a sweet and a happy new year. As Rabbi Wolpe undoubtedly knows, I am a cosmologist. So I want to wish him, as we cosmologists will do, wish him an early uh, 5,781st year uh, since the creation of the universe in a fiery Big Bang. Uh, universe accomplished a lot, Rabbi. It's very impressive. So my guest today is uh, a gentleman that I've been following at a distance, stalking, if you will, for more than two years now, dying to get him on the show. And I thought this would be a great chance to do it. He's been on uh, the podcast with my good friend Eric Weinstein, the Portal Podcast. He runs a podcast, which is my weekly listening uh, uh, for Shabbat, which is a podcast production that he makes out of the Sinai Temple. First, I want to introduce him. His name is Rabbi David J. Wolpe. He's the Max Webb Senior Rabbi of Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, and he's not only America's rabbi, but he's the most influential rabbi in America, uh, so says Newsweek magazine, and he's one of the most 50, uh, 50 most influential Jews in the world, according to the Jerusalem Post. What do they know? You know, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're really biased. Yeah. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't buy there. Yeah. <laughs> they, they might be slightly biased. Uh, Sinai Temple, of course, is in the Westwood District of Los Angeles. It's the oldest and largest conservative congregation in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here, Rabbi. Uh, thank you so thank much for, uh, for joining us on the Into the Impossible podcast. Thank you, and I want to thank you at the outset for giving scientific confirmation to the uh, Jewish state of the universe there. That's 5781, right. you said. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Since the Big Bang. Um, <laughs> That may that may ruffle a few feathers in the scientific community there, but ah, you, that's uh, right. you that's came right. right out and said it. Well, I know that you are a fan of Robert Jastrow's book *God and the Astronomers*, yeah. and maybe if we have time, we'll talk about that because, okay. of course, it was a you know some some Jews have played slight uh, slight roles in the discovery of yeah. different aspects of the universe's age. And yeah. I want to talk about that and kind of some of the uh, special, um, uniquely Jewish or perhaps uh, specifically Jewish aspects. But before we get into that, I want to ask you um, if you were abducted by aliens, and we're going to get it deep into aliens because I know, okay. I, know uh, I have to appeal to your science fiction loving side. But uh, if you were to be abducted by aliens, they randomly come to Westwood. They pick a random right. person at large, uh, happen to pick you, and they ask you, uh, who are you? Uh, how do you answer that question? So this has happened, of course. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, I, I mean, if they ask who I am, the interesting thing, of course, is that among we earthlings, uh, what the answer to that question is generally, what do you do for a living? So I suppose I would say I'm a rabbi. Um, but if I was abducted by aliens, uh, I might say that, you know, I'm, I'm a human being, um, that I'm a child. Uh, that I, uh, I believe in certain things pretty strongly uh, and uh, that I hope they're, they have benevolent intentions towards my uh, fellow earthlings. <laughs> so it's very interesting that you describe yourself, of course, as a, as a father. I think that's uh, yes. part of the root of the word rabbi. Is it not a, der a derivative, uh, at least in some sense, of the word av, which means father? Is that not correct? I guess Rob could be similar, and it also means teacher. Um, and teachers and parents are very intertwined in the Jewish tradition. Absolutely, you're supposed to honor your teacher the way you honor your parent. Um, and yeah, I do. Also, uh, I had a father who was a rabbi as well, uh, and to whom I was very close uh, and thought very highly of. So I suppose that role does have particular significance to me. Um, but if you were asking me how would I define myself professionally, I would define myself as a rabbi. I write, I teach. Um, I'm, uh, I'm someone who also has deep uh, interests in philosophy, literature, other areas outside of specifically Jewish texts and teachings, um, but that's my foundation stone. Yeah, that's uh, sort of what I was interested in, in kind of honing in on because you do so much, you've written books, you are obviously a rabbi, that's your profession. Um, yeah, um, you told me offline, you went in, into it for the money, which is the same reason right. I became a professor at a state, exactly. at a state university, uh, that's right. and especially a cosmologist at that. Yeah. Um, 
but you know, I think it's it, it's very interesting. And I once heard at, at shul once at synagogue once. You know, someone asked me, you know, uh, you know, what are you, or you know, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm a cosmologist. And I, usually that's a conversation starter. It's like nobody ever meets right. a Jew and, and they find out, oh, you're Jewish. And it's like, oh, you know, pass the, uh, pass the pickles. You know, it's something interesting about being a Jew. There's something interesting. And it's not better or worse. It just is. There's something interesting about being a cosmologist. And the guy said, no, that's what you do. That's not who you are. Uh, but I think with a rabbi, it is sort of who you are. I mean, you're the only guys who can get paid to work on Shabbos without violating, you know, laws of melacha. Well, yeah. So it's also true that it's not a role in the sense that someone doesn't say, oh, there's Joe. He's a friend of mine. By the way, he's also a lawyer. Yes. <laughs> um, instead, you are always the rabbi. And there are advantages and disadvantages to that. But when someone sees me in the supermarket, that's the rabbi in the supermarket. Or they see me taking a walk early in the morning, that's the rabbi taking a walk. And, and it is astonishing um, how difficult it is for almost anyone to separate the role from the person. My father um, had a good friend who once started to tell him a dirty joke and stopped himself and said, oh, Rabbi, if you weren't here, could I tell you a joke? <laughs> so that sense of the pervasive, now it's less true now, I think, than it was you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. Um, but, uh, but it is still deeply true. Do you ever that, wish uh, that you <laughs> couldn't, that you could be sort of free of that expectation? You know, you'd hear a lot more dirty jokes. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I should say your repertoire, uh, and your daily pulpit off the pulpit, yeah. uh, seminar, uh, uh yeah. Sheeran, I do love jokes. Are really good. Um, They're hilarious. And I do have some that I can't tell, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, the, the answer is there are moments when I wish I could escape it, but, but by and large, I, I think that it's, uh, I'm glad for, for what I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to talk to you uh, about, you know, a lot of the times as a rabbi, my understanding is that uh, you have to listen to a lot of what your congregation wants. And there's the old adage, you know, two Jews, three opinions. Um, do you ever yeah. feel like you want to be asked questions? Do you ever feel like there's questions that you are just dying that you wish somebody would ask you? Um, I don't, I wonder whether there are specific questions that uh, that I haven't been asked that I would be desperate to be asked. I don't think so of him. Um, I think that I get generally a fairly broad range of questions. Um, but but I, I have noticed that um, what has happened to the Jewish community in general, and certainly to my community, is that Questions of Jewish learning, which used to be part of the staple of being a rabbi, are much less frequent mm. than they are. And that's for two reasons. One, because the Jewish community is less interested in questions of Jewish learning. And the second is because, to be perfectly honest, a lot of the things that people ask me, they can Google. Mm -hmm and find out the information as easily, maybe more reliably and more detailed than anything I could tell them. <laughs> and so I tend to get questions more of judgment and of opinion and less of knowledge. Mm. That, that mm. has changed, that has changed. Yeah, I've heard it said, uh, you know, the most cited academic in history is a woman by the name of Marilyn Vos Savant, because Correct. she's published in Parade Magazine. And exactly. it's always like, you know, uh, questions that are coming in are like, uh, what was the uh, you know capital of Phoenicia in like 13 BCE or whatever, and it's like easily things you could look up. And similarly too with uh, the New York Times crossword puzzle, there used to be a tip yeah. line. You could call in for a tip line, and I used to you know run up my uh, my mom's credit card bill uh, by doing that. But yeah, you're right. There are so many things. But when Judaism is a very legalistic. Uh, and it's it's not sort of consensus based. It's more I would say it's more authority based. And I wonder, could you explain to me how you see conservative Judaism? People might be familiar with you know the majority of Jews are what we call Reform Jews, correct? Yeah, these days probably so. So generally, um, conservative Judaism, which was once the majority tradition in America, but now is not, um, conservative Judaism was an attempt to uh, look at with modern 
historical tools at the tradition and assert that it changed historically and needed to change historically. And therefore, um, part of the Jewish legal system should be taking into account the different situations in which Jews found themselves. Uh, I think that that's so you used to use slogans like tradition and change, um, positive historical Judaism. What has happened in the 21st, 20th and 21st century is the discovery that as soon, and this is my own interpretation of it, as soon as you remove God said you have to do this. You are in then the area of you should do it for the following reasons. And so conservative and, and by extension reformed Jews spend their time saying you should practice Judaism because. And we have lots of causes, and many of them I think are very compelling and very beautiful. None of them is as compelling as because the creator of everything that exists told you to do it. Mm. So I do believe that for non literalist Judaism, there is an ideological struggle, which is very, very hard to make. Conservative Jews, in theory, still keep kosher, still keep Shabbat, um, still observe the holidays, but it is an uphill struggle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, typically it's, uh, you know, people will, will kind of rely on rabbis almost to get their opinion on the existence of God and so forth. And I think that there's an awful lot of pressure, it must feel like, to, to be in that position, uh, especially when there's aspects of loss and growth and connection. And even you know, the pressure of keeping the Jewish, uh, the Jewish kind of culture and, and, and tradition alive. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the, these days there are two different kinds of pressure. And they are, uh, and they're different, but they're at least equal. One is the pressure that you enunciated about how do you keep the Jewish tradition alive after all you've given your life to it and, and, and it's so hard. We were talking about the fact that we're doing services online so different from anything we've ever done and how difficult that is and how do you maintain it. The other pressure, which will not surprise any of your listeners, um, is the pressure for political statements because the Jewish polity, like every other polity right now in America, is bitterly, unalterably, um, and, and savagely even divided between the right and the left. Uh, and they are living in real alternative realities in which the concerns of the other do not impinge. And if you are a rabbi, as I am, and you have people on both sides of that divide, which I do, um, you cannot split the difference. Mm. Um, and so there is a constant be on my side, be on my side that I get. Um, you should see my email. My email is like basically divided between um, this side is right and that side is right. And this or or more accurately and more commonly, that side is a jerk. The other side is a jerk. Um, <laughs> And so it's become very, very difficult to uh, to navigate those uh, those political waters. And do you feel like that those political waters really are getting more and more turbulent in these particular times that we live or live in now? I oh mean, yeah, you were oh, very yeah. outspoken this summer and took very courageous stands. You know, when it came to the Black Lives Matter movement, and I think that. But uh, do you feel I would more like, pressure I, than I ever? Wanna, I want to be really clear. Well, we did not take a stand on the Black Lives Matter movement just for this reason. What I did was I put a sign up on the synagogue mm -hmm. that said, we stand with our African-American brothers and sisters against racism. Mm -hmm. Didn't talk about Black Lives Matter specifically because Black Lives Matter right now, especially in the Jewish community, is extremely polarizing because some of the leaders of Black Lives Matter have made anti-Israel and even anti-Semitic statements. And yet... I thought that it was really important for Jews to make a statement about racial justice. And so that was a perfect example of how I wanted even our own black members, because we have black Jews in the synagogue, to know we care about this. We notice this. We want to stand up with you. But I also want to avoid the political turbulence that comes with any slogan. It wasn't easy. Uh, and some people really didn't like on both sides. 
but there you go. Yeah. And when you, um, when we think about, you know, part of the objective of many rabbis, I think it's admirable, mm -hmm. is to increase the the participation both at the younger, you know, kind of population level. It's often said that, you know, Judaism is a dying religion. I mean, that, that's been said, you know, more times than they said Mark Twain was yes. dead, or Alfred yeah. Nobel was dead, <laughs> in the case that I'm interested in. Um, but, you know, I, I find a lot of times with the kids that I see at the Hillel here at UC San Diego, you know, they're kind of defined by, or they see Judaism, if they think about it at all, as kind of split between, well, the Israel-Palestine conflict or right. the Holocaust. And none of the those aspects really appealed to me when I became what's called a Baal Teshuva, a returnee to Judaism after being a, an altar boy in the Catholic Church, as I describe in my book. Uh, we won't get into that now. Uh, but, uh, but the point is, you know, coming back to be to the religion of my birth. Uh, was not motivated by guilt over the Holocaust or, uh, or or perhaps, you know, wanting to take sides politically on Zionistic reasons. How do you, you know, the kind of famous Hillel, you know, convince me standing on one leg, not that God exists or whatever, but just why should a young person, why should an old person, you know, I came back to Judaism at age 30 and learned Hebrew, etc. It was very difficult, but uh, convince me on one leg, you know, what sort of What's sort of your approach to positive Judaism rather than reactionary Judaism? Well, I wrote a book called Why Be Jewish? Mm -hmm. And in it, I say, um, I say, it is the oldest continuous tradition in the world that teaches people how to grow their souls. And that's my principal opening gambit is if you want to learn how to grow your soul, and I believe that that's actually the reason why we exist in this world is to do so. Um, Judaism is here to teach you how to do it. And also, it allows you to join a people. You will never be alone in the world if you're part of this people. Um, and it teaches you how to work in the world to make the world better. Mm -hmm. All those things I believe are true. It is also true that although it, it, it isn't the case for you, for many Jews, um, the historical experience of the Jewish people, uh, of which the Holocaust and the founding of the state of Israel are the great events of the last 500,000 years, um, those are very powerful in spurs of identity. Um, I was, in fact, before COVID uh, came upon us, I was supposed to lead March of the Living this year. When you bring uh, people to Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, and, and march between them. And many, many, many young people have done that, and some of them go on to, to Israel, and they find it an extraordinarily powerful awakener of their own religious uh, and spiritual attachments. So it's true that it's not true, that it doesn't work for everyone, but for many it does. Mm -hmm. And when I think about, uh, yeah, and, and it's not to say that those aren't influential. I've had been lucky right. enough to have on my podcast uh, Rose Schindler, who with her husband Max uh, both survived uh, the Holocaust yeah. case, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and uh, she's, uh, she's a tremendous force. I just talked to her uh, for my, my birthday. She gave us a call. Uh, and Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. That's and when great. I, yes, it's, it is. It's another lap around a lap yeah. around the, 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 the sun. And actually, maybe that will segue nicely into what I was going to ask next, which is, you know, um, we think about why is it so important that the Torah, as we're going to be reading not too long from now in the weekly cycles, uh, yeah. that uh, the beginning of the universe, why is that the foundational event uh, along with the exodus from Egypt? What makes those so foundational that the rabbis in their wisdom put those as the foundational things that we say on all holidays? Why, why do we remember, you know, for example, the exodus from Egypt, not only on Passover, but every Saturday, every Friday right. night? So I think that it's, it's beautiful and important the way you paired them, because uh, there is a, uh, there's a philosophical problem about God, about transcendence and imminence. How could God be so far away and still so close? And without entering into the philosophy of it, um, you've just summarized the imagery of it, which is, here is God who created the universe, which makes God infinitely greater than everything that is. But this same God cared enough about the fate of these individuals in the tucked away 
in this corner of the cosmos to make sure that their suffering was, uh, was ended. And so I think those are the reasons. It's that there's the, there is, as one uh, Jewish philosopher, Yudha Levi, put it, there's the God of the philosophers and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And both of them play a part in Judaism. Um, so you were going to say. Yeah, you recently said, and, and, and that really brings up an, a, another thought in my mind, you recently said in your Off the Pulpit podcast, you, you recently said you know one of the most important mitzvahs is is essentially the mitzvah of of forgetting and uh, or, or the trait I would say that maybe it's a character trait the midot mida of of forgetfulness of course the Torah you know implores the Jewish people to never forget what the people right. known as Amalek did how do you square those two things you know on one hand we're commanded on another hand we're remembering what happened that we were slaves in egypt and yet how do we forgive you know i have i have wonderful friends that live in germany you know for example uh Paul, right. how do we reconcile those twin you know kind of uh, the forces that are opposing so first of all I, I mean those twin forces exist both in the command to amalek it says wipe out their memory don't forget which is a way of saying forget them don't forget to forget them um which guarantees memory but Forgiveness and forgetting are not the same thing. Um, the uh, Adam Michnik, the Polish dissident, once said, uh, I'm for amnesty, but not amnesia. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same thing is true here. Judaism doesn't ask you to forget the bad things that have been done. And also, I think, asks, you know, when, when you mentioned Germany, there are very, very, very few people in Germany still alive today who did bad things. Right. to the Jews That's in true. the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And the children of evil people do not themselves bear the responsibility for their parents' deeds. Um, however, having said that, if you do forget, it is the, it, it's the unmastered past that controls you. It's not the things you remember. Uh, we learn that, uh, you know, that uh, certainly goes back to Freud, for that matter, goes back to Greek um, mm -hmm. literature. It's when in even Jewish literature, when you forget where you came from, who you are, then you're liable to go astray. When you remember, then you have a direction. So um, I think that that's now there, there is, as you mentioned, there's strategic forgetting in some ways. But I think that Judaism clearly does stand on the side of memory. And, uh, and Zohar, to remember, is a commandment. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from, uh, we've got a pretty good sized audience now, so I'm gonna take one from Fabian Mango, Fabian Mango. He says, for me, there's always been a clear difference between church, the Christian organization, and the actual religion slash, with, you know, in other words, my, his personal relationship with God. Right. Is there such a difference in Judaism? Thanks. Not, not nearly as much, and I'll tell you why. Um, this is a wonderful point, and, and, and Fabian, uh, I, I have occasion to make this point to both Christians and Jews. Judaism is not a religion. Christianity is a religion. Because today, if you believe in Jesus, you're a Christian. If next week you decide, you know what, I don't believe any of that stuff, you're not a Christian anymore. Judaism works differently. If tomorrow I say, all oh, that rabbi stuff, Brian, I was wrong. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Judaism. I'm still Jewish. Too bad. Because what Judaism is, is a religious family. That is, religion is at the heart of it, but it's familial. That's why you're born Jewish, and that's why you can, you can not want to be part of the family. You still are. The only way in Judaism that you leave is if you choose another family. That is, Jews who converted to Christianity, even though, strictly speaking, that wasn't recognized by Jewish law, they were read out of the Jewish community. Um, so when you say I don't like the synagogue, it's perfectly, believe me, it's a long Jewish tradition to not like the synagogue, not like the rabbi. There's an old, old, old Jewish joke about a guy who finds Keep it a clean, Jew rabbi. A, Keep it clean. A Jew, right. He finds a Jew on a desert island. And right. he has two synagogues. And he says, so you're alone here. What do you need to build two synagogues for? He goes, well, this one I pray in, and that one I wouldn't set foot into. <laughs> In other words, the idea like that you dislike a synagogue, that is an old idea. Yeah. But the establishment of the religion is not separate from the religion. Mm. 
That is, Judaism is a religion. And I want to say one more thing about is a, is a religious family, and they're, they're inextricably intertwined. I want to say one more thing. Um, people say to me sometimes, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And what that means to me is I want to feel things, but I don't want to do things. I actually don't have a lot of respect for the spiritual but not religious idea. Yeah. If you tell me you're spiritual but not religious, I want to know how much money do you give to, to charity, to tzedakah. Right. Because religion is the enactment of what you feel. And that's why if you're religious, you got to go to committee meetings and you have to go to prayer services and you have to deal with other people. And there's politics involved. Politics, by the way, almost always means I didn't get what I want. When someone tells me there's too much politics in the synagogue, I know they didn't get what they wanted. Someone else did. Um, but I love the old story about the guy who comes to the rabbi and he says, you know, rabbi, I'd go to your synagogue. But honestly, there's too many hypocrites there. And the rabbi thinks for me and he goes, you know, you're right. But there's always room for one more. <laughs> so. We all have that same impulse. It's like, I want to be above it. I don't want to fight. But the fight is where the things get done. Yeah. It's where yeah. the things get done. Yeah. That's the, that, oh, go ahead, Roman. I was going to say, that's why I actually have a less cynical view of politics than most people do, because I know that it's not nearly as easy to get stuff done in a political world as people might think. Yeah. You and know, politics is sort of the highest expression of, you know, the ultimate lo building blocks, at least of humanity and yeah. how we actually enact and, uh, and relate to one another. Yeah. Actually, getting back to what you said, I think I, I had this conversation uh, with Ben Shapiro on his Sunday special last year, exactly at this time. And uh, I said, you know, most people say they're agnostic, you know, as scientists, if they'll say that they're not atheist. And I right. always say, oh, yeah, well, which um, which, you know, church do you not go to? Because it's the same one as Richard Dawkins, the one that he doesn't go to. And, you know, the separation of active participation, I always say, you know, I don't know, Rabbi, if I believe in God, but I believe in religion. I believe that right. there is a value to religion. And I think, you know, I am a, I am an agnostic in that sense that I am constantly questioning, constantly searching. Uh, I think it was Elie Wiesel who said, you know, a Jew cannot be, a Jew can be angry at God, but a Jew can't be without God. Uh, how do you come down on that side of that of that uh, statement? I mean, I agree. I think that God is central to the Jewish tradition, and uh, but not believing in God, but but actually wrestling with God. And, right? and I think that right. I also think that that what how you think about God. I don't even want to say what God is, but how you think about God is much much more various than most Jews or Christians, for that matter. Um, know or suspect. And the reason that that's so is that they stopped their religious education when they were 13, which is a tragedy because adult sophisticated thought about the realities of God is adult sophisticated thought, just like in any other field, Physics, like yeah. cosmology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in fact, I, that's another thing I brought up with Ben on my conversation. I said, you know, Einstein didn't ask what happens if I travel at the speed of light and look into a mirror until he was in his 20s. And it was good that he didn't, he said, because he would have asked the smartest person he knew, his dad. And his dad would have said, oh, it's just happened. You know, nobody knows. It'll never be. And he would have accepted that as a seven-year-old or as a 13-year-old. And I always yeah. think of these great Jewish atheists, Carl Sagan, um, whose wife I've had or widow I've had on my show and his daughter I've had on my show. And they're both, you know, devoutly uh, secular people. But I asked them, as I'll ask you at the end of this conversversation uh, in about ninety minutes no, I'm just kidding and, and uh, at the proper time as it comes to the end of the hour. but you know I asked what was what is your ethical will um, and I'll ask you that what would you put in this ethical will to to Andrewian, who's Carl Sagan's widow, and she says to you know to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly and I was like, ah, oh, you're missing us you know you're missing. Uh, <laughs> three words at the end with your God and she said, no, that's intentional. She views the wisdom of our tradition not a superior yeah. but she and she obviously doesn't practice at all but but that there is value and that we give up I, I said you know another thing I say frequently is what if I gave up or what if I said at age 13 or a 13 year old comes to me and says you know professor Keating I know all there is about physics Einstein was right. wrong I said get out of here you little pisha you know, as my uh, my grandpa, uh, Bubby, Bubby and Zadie used to call me, right? So, um, so I'd say, yeah, forget about it. No, no one. Maybe in math, you might be able to come up with something. But 13 years old, you need so much wisdom. You need so much uh, experience as an experimental physicist, especially. No 13 year old can do it. 
Um, and so I, I would discount it. And now seemingly, I would also not take the advice of a 13 year old young man, i.e. myself, when I decide, oh, this is all supernatural shenanigans. And I think right. it really does a disservice. I mean, that's my kind of one leg conversion is, is that, you know, you're missing out on so much in our tradition. And it doesn't even matter if you're Jewish or not. There's so much in there. And people are asking in the, in the chat, are, you know, aren't all these religions the same? Aren't the, all these, you know, the fact that Judaism and Christianity, et cetera, and Islam come from the Abrahamic tradition, isn't that sort of a proof of God or, or some commonality? What, what do you think about that? So here's the question. So, uh, I mean, the way that I think of religions is that they are different languages to speak to the same ultimate reality. And, and that's why I, I, and some of my Jewish colleagues do and, and will get upset when I say this. That's why it is not my job to argue Judaism's superiority. Right. It is my job to argue Judaism's excellence. And the reason I say that is I, have to, I want to be intellectually honest. I never was a Muslim. Hmm. I never was a Christian. I never was a Jain. I never was a Buddhist. So for me to say, listen, the Sikhs don't have it right. The Jews do. <laughs> when I know... One hundred thousand, if that, about what it is to be a Sikh compared to what I know it is to be a Jew, is it's absurd. So I, I don't, I try not to pronounce on the truth claims of other religions because I don't think that it's useful or important. What is useful and important is what your religion makes of you, um, and there I believe that Judaism. Has, a, has an extraordinarily strong claim in the world um, that it has made a remarkable, devoted, capable, um, contributing people, not perfect, obviously, but who is. Uh, and so I, I, without understanding what God is or beginning to think I have the slightest glimpse, I do believe that in living a Jewish life, I am in some way living in conformity with the way that God would want me to live. Mm. On the Portal uh, podcast with Eric Weinstein, our mutual friend, uh, you said something to the effect that uh, you almost believe that uh, belief in God is almost as generative as, uh, as grammar is, according to one of my previous yeah. guests, Noam Chomsky. You know, grammar is sort of an intrinsic quantity that is expressed differently. As you said, religion is expressed differently. Right. Uh, in what sense do you did you mean that? And then I have a follow up question about that relating to prayer, which is which is my okay. stumbling block. So first of all, I meant it in whatever way will separate me from Noam Chomsky. <laughs> um, but but that's a separate that's a separate issue. Uh, but I I, I I would say um, the the vastness of the possibility of conceptions of God, forget the vastness of God, which is infinitely vaster than anything I can imagine. I mean, this is what I said. I don't remember if I said this on Eric's podcast. I sometimes tell teenagers, can you, when you were two years old, you know what it is to be a 13 year old? Yeah. And they say, obviously, no, a no, two year old has no idea what it is to be a 13 year old. And I say, well, God is greater in proportion to you than you are to a two year old. So when right. we you say, did say we that, but, but, but how do you know, like you did say that on Eric's podcast. That's, that's great. I but. mean, that's, that's how that I'm expressing Judaism's belief, just yeah. so that you understand that from the Jewish tradition, you can't possibly really talk about God. And, and yet the idea of God is in fact, so generative, as you say, mm -hmm. that it explodes into a million different paths of life, ways of understanding traditions and so on um and uh and and i believe i will say this i believe that every spiritual and religious tradition takes inspiration from and in some way intuits the same ultimate reality that i will say mm -hmm. how they get there and what they do with that varies you know enormously enormously right. all the different expressions that could take place. right um one of my uh, uh commentators uh who goes i think this is the hebrew name rust in peace uh says uh he understands or she understands the cultural aspect to religion just not why it's those of us that want evidence before believing 
are the ones who are thought to be strange. I don't know. It's just an honest position. What's what say you, Rabbi? Okay. First of all, I, I don't think anybody calls you strange. I mean, if they do, that, that's silly to say that an intellectual position is strange. Um, what I would say is that it, you're making a category mistake, I believe. A uh, category mistake is like saying um, brown is long. Uh, that is, you're applying the wrong category to something. Because you're applying the kind of proof that you use for a scientific proposition to something that is not a scientific proposition. It is rather an orientation of life. It is like saying, I want proof that life is worth living before I open my eyes. In other words, it's a fundamental posture towards the universe. Um, that's why I don't think of God as an entity that you either believe in or you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. God is a lived reality in your life, and you can live in such a way as to bring that reality into your life or not. Um, that's why I always found, like, what happened with, with Sam, when I when I had debates with Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins or so on, the debates that I thought the part of the debates that I thought were fruitful and real were is religion good for the world, but the parts of the debates that were really just you know can I be funnier than you are is God real because they were applying the wrong standard I think to the wrong question, which is God is as real as my consciousness in moments when I feel God, and I don't want to say that I'm, I mean, I'm not one of those religiously gifted people that feels God at every moment. But when I do, God is as real as my consciousness. And to ask me, is my consciousness real? Is to ask a question that has no real purchase for me. So if you're going to say, I won't believe in God until I get the evidence, then what I would say to you is, you're not even on the path that would lead you there anyway. So of course you won't get that evidence. Mm -hmm. um, because if you were, you would see certain things as evidence like the existence of the world or the reality of love or the fact that two and two equals four, which is astonishing. Or the fact that your mind can comprehend the fact that two and two equals four. On and on and on and on. Um, because uh, for most of us, just the, the what, what one, uh, Jewish philosopher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, calls radical amazement is the beginning of belief. Mm. You know, what do you make of these? You know, there are many different um, uh, kind of approaches to the question of proving God's existence. I, I feel those are all fruitless. And the proof yeah. to me is that, you know, many of them rely on, say, scientific uh, consilience when right. the scientific method is predicated on an adversarial kind of striving for truth, which I want to get into if we have time, uh, the, the commonality between what I call the Jewish method and the scientific method. Uh, maybe if we have time, we'll get to that. But it's more important that I ask these questions first. And that's, you know, you hear things I've, I've heard from, from rabbis that I respect and love, you know, oh, the proof is that all the kosher animals are listed. You know, there's no, there's no hyper pigs or quantum, you know, whatever uh, that are, you know, or there's only one animal. I mean, they're cute things or the Bible yeah. codes. That's another, I have a very, very loving, deep relationship with, with rabbis and friends that believe deeply in the Bible codes and, and so forth. Well, I they, they should read, they should read Jeff Tige writing about the Bible codes. First of all, the Bible codes are, are easily, easily, I think, um, disproven. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not even hard to disprove them. And, and it requires so much intellectual um, prestidigitation, I'll put it that way, to, uh, to maintain the Bible codes is very funny. You change spellings of things. Anyway, um, I don't know. I don't believe it, that, uh, that the creator of the universe left behind a, a New York Times crossword puzzle so that you would know that, that the creator of the universe really exists. Which is also um, in Moby it, Dick, which is also in it Moby makes, Dick. Right. And, right. It makes God so absurdly small right. um, that, that, uh, that I, it's one of those cases of, uh, of the necessity of bringing God down to the narrowness of my own mind. Right. I, I What's prefer, the opposite I, of Simpson? What is the opposite of Simpson? Yeah, right, Simpson exactly. is sort of the yeah. opposite. He pashtut, he expansion. 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 <laughs> Simpson is contraction. He pashtut is expansion. Right, exactly. 
So yeah. uh, I often find that the people want to have that, you know, they, oh, you're a cosmologist, you know, and, and can you give me, you know, some reasons to strengthen my faith? And I, you know, I, I always say you know, it's, it's sort of interesting that we, we put so much stock in this in both you know, in scientists nowadays, we see that in the COVID crisis, of course, we see the debates that are taking place on university campuses about global warming and other things, not even debates, but, but just these heated discussions. And then I'll give a talk about the origin of the universe and someone will say, well, what do you think about global warming? And I'll say, well, I hope when you have somebody speaking about you know, climate change and somebody asks you, ask the speaker a question about uh, the origin of the universe, that the speaker has enough legitimacy, you know, to say integrity to say, well, why don't right. you talk to a cosmologist? But wh I, I think it's a natural thing that people sort of idolize science and they've come yeah. to this role. And you're, of course, in the capital of idolatry right now in Los Angeles, California, right. where Hollywood rules. Do you think idolatry is intrinsic to the human to human nature? I mean, it's so much in the Torah, in the Ten Commandments, it appears a couple times alone. And the question, why is it there? Like, I don't, I don't like want to bow down to a statue of Baal, you know, anymore. No, than... you don't. Not anymore, you don't. But for a long time, you did. Um, right. Not you. No Baal. But yes, no Baal. The, the, the desire, no the desire to worship, is deep in human beings. Um, and I would say, look, I, I think you see it in the political sphere, too. Um, people feel deeply attached beyond uh, so much so that, that when you approach somebody about the flaws of the political figure they love, they can't really hear it. Mm -hmm. Or they say, well, yeah, but that, that, that doesn't matter because we really do have a venerative capacity. We venerate things. Um, and... Uh, and I would just also say that the reason that idolatry, at least again, to, to recur to Heschel, since I mentioned him before, there's a beautiful phrase about idolatry. He says, look, it's not, idolatry, it's not about the fact that you, you carve this statue and you say, this statue is God and God gets insulted. He said, you know, God is big. God can take the insult. The problem, he says, is that there is a real image of God in this world. And it's in every human face. And when you point to other things and make them important instead of human beings, then you've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so if we took each other seriously as images of God, I think that uh, we would act very differently towards one another. And if we understood that we were all we all shared that we wouldn't assume that there are certain people who are so far above the flaws that, that the devil, the rest of us, that we would worship them. But it, it doesn't, we don't work that way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you, so if it's part of something deep in the human psyche, is it safe to say that you have your own idols, Rabbi? I mean, was it a, was it a, a huge accomplishment when you became the Max Webb you know, senior rabbi, for example? Is that something you were striving for that could become an no. idol? No, no, not, not that, um, not that. In fact, I, I never, thought I was going to be a, a synagogue rabbi. I wanted to be a professor and a writer. It was a, okay. it was a somewhat circuitous route it is. to become a synagogue <laughs> rabbi. Um, and, and also, idolatry generally, at least in my, in my experience, it's not about oneself. There are people whom I admire tremendously who it's hard for me to hear negative things about. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not objective about them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's absolutely true. And... Uh, and there are people whom I've met in my life um, that I came to them with, uh, you know, with a sense of of beyond normal admiration. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that impulse and, and in fact, I'll tell you weirdly, I'll tell you the time that I most understood the impulse to worship a human being and idolatry. Um, so I've had a couple of health crises. I've had uh, Cancer. lymphoma and mm -hmm. chemotherapy and i also had a brain tumor and i had a couple brain surgeries mm -hmm. and the first time i had a brain surgery after i uh, i still didn't know whether it was going to be uh, uh you know life ending or not or malignant or anyway the guy who uh, the doctor at ucla who had operated on me came into my room not long after i, re I recovered consciousness and i remember feeling at the moment I first saw him, this inexplicable uprush of worship. It's like this wasn't a person. Right. And 
I and I also remember at the same time being astonished by it and thinking to myself, oh, this this is the feeling that people have when they worship someone. <laughs> um, and now later on, I saw him again. He returned to being a human being. But I will never forget that sense of this is a God in my room. Um, and I realized also at the time, and I have seen this certainly with rabbis and others, I realized also how distorting and dangerous that can be to the person to whom it is directed. Mm. Because yeah. they think of themselves. Go ahead. No, I just want to ask you, I mean, I so there's a statement, I think, in the Talmud. I mean, everything's in the Talmud. There's 2,700 pages there. Uh, but one of it's like, you know, halakha or Jewish law can become a form of idolatry. And I even think religion can be a form of idolatry. And the proof of that is all the things that aren't religions that are yeah. forms of, of religion. In other words, atheism can be a form of religion, environmentalism. They all have wonderful aspects and, and, and truth seeking at some level. But uh, yeah. is it not possible that, you know, even Judaism, even halakhic Judaism, or even, you know, conservative Orthodox reform could be a form of idolatry? Yes, you can make, you can worship anything beyond what it merits and deserves. No question about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I want to ask you, uh, when it comes down to, you know, as you said, people have this innate desire to worship. I want to talk about worship. I, I personally find it very hard. You know, I know you've never been asked, you know, to solve someone's problems in Judaism, but uh, this isn't your synagogue's problem, right? So this is my problem. I, I can relate to Judaism on an intellectual level. I love studying the Talmud. I love reading the Torah. Uh, I love looking for connections and, and just like wonderful things that apply today. I mean, one, one great example is, you know, there's a, something called the shopkeeper law in Judaism, which states that you're not allowed to go into a physical store and ask the merchant for the price of something when you know for sure you're not going to buy it. And 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 why is that? What what's wrong with that? You know, you're stealing the hopes of somebody. You're, there's a sensitivity that you need to have to every human being and call the homer all the more so to uh, to you know people that you love and people in your life. But you're not allowed to get people's hopes up. I love those kinds of things. I love thinking about those kinds of things. Uh, but my question to you is, what about prayer? I mean, can you be a Jew? Uh, obviously, you can't be a Jew and not, you know, have God in the sense that you're confronting God. Can you be a Jew who doesn't pray or cannot pray? You can. Of course you can. You can be a Jew who does almost anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say this. Uh, I, I like this. This is my favorite image of prayer, and it may help. So there was a, a 17th, an 18th century rabbi, Leona Medina, an Italian rabbi. And when I read his image of prayer, it never left me. He said, imagine that you're standing on the shore and you see a guy pulling his boat to the shore. If you were mistaken about mechanics in motion, you might think he was pulling the shore to the boat. <laughs> and when people pray, they make the same mistake. They think what they're doing is pulling God closer to them. I want this. I will pray for it. So God will do it. The butler. But in, fact, butler, right? <laughs> but in fact, he says, what you're doing when you pray is you're pulling yourself closer to God. Mm. And if you rise from your prayer, now I'm, I'm riffing on what he said, if you rise from your prayer a better person, a more sensitive person, a more aware person, your prayer is answered. Mm. If what you want from your prayer is to move God, I mean, I remember, again, to return to the same, to the same thing. When I was sick, I remember thinking, is it really true that because some people are, are praying for me, that God's going to look down and say, okay, Wolpe has someone praying for him. I'm going to save him. But the guy in bed three, I have heard nothing. I've heard nothing. So psh, let him go. I don't believe God works that way. But I, I don't do want a God that, that works that way. Right? I don't want a God that I agree. But I do believe that the prayer strengthened me, made me feel less alone, all of that. I still could have died, but... But that prayer worked. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, I obviously feel like it, it might be the same way, the piece of advice for myself that goes, you know, you have to take it seriously. And, and, and if you don't, it's like, I feel like the penalty for missing, for breaking Shabbos is you miss out on Shabbos. Like I don't work on Shabbos. Right. I don't email, I don't make phone calls, I don't tweet. I don't do any of that. Not because, you know, I know that God is going to punish me or whatever. Right, because I know course. it's not good for me. It takes me right. out of this world in a good way to be with my friends, my wife, my kids, my uh, my family. 
Um, and so I just think it's, uh, it's, it might be the same. I might be missing this gene, you know, of prayer, but it might be to my detriment. And I wonder if there are any kinds of exercises or, I mean, do you meditate? I've always wondered, do you meditate or what do you feel like the connection? Between I meditation? don't. Okay. I don't. Um, I pray mm -hmm. uh, and I take long walks, although I generally, when I take walks, honestly, listen to books on tape. Mm -hmm. uh, I listen to Victorian novels. I've listened to almost all of Trollope. I listen yes. to Austin. I listen, uh, that's, that's, uh, um, and I find that very meditative, although other people may find it boring as hell. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, so, but so that's I've something never... you have in common with Noam Chomsky. Uh, what? He does that too? He does not meditate, but he reads a lot oh, of Trollope. He does not Trollope. meditate. He oh. reads a lot of Trollope. Oh, uh, maybe I should start meditating. Um, but uh, <laughs> he says the nicest things uh, about you, Rabbi. I yeah, know. right. Sure, he does. <laughs> he did grow up as the child of a Hebrew teacher in Philadelphia, so we're not entirely. Uh, That's right. You know, we're not entirely distant in a certain way, but but uh, but I but I do not understand mm. the the virulence with which mm. I, I with which I read his. Um, his insistent distancing from his own people and his own tradition with a with an edge that is cruel and uh, and and biting and to me very painful. Yeah. Uh, but that's a separate. Yeah, I guess this, this isn't the Noam Chomsky hour. Right. No, that, um, that's right. But it is illustrative. I do think that there's, you know, when I was talking to him, I'm like, this guy, you put a kippa on him and he's, you know, he's like one of the rabbis of Bratislava. Exactly. You know? I mean, right. and he has this wisdom and avuncular character. And yeah, if you if you steer away from the 99 percent of you know, uh, the stuff that you, that you really just find detestable. But, you know, and I said, look, I don't agree with you. There are people that find a lot of what he said repulsive, but I'm just going to talk about what is interesting to my audience and what I'm personally interested in, because quite frankly, I don't care what he has to say other than, yes, it, it is true. He could have a detrimental effect, but I, I want to move away so, from it to, to a rapid fire series. Cause I know you have to go in a few minutes, Rabbi. And I, well, I want to tell you one quick thing. Okay. Shlomo Karl Bach once yes. said, yes. A, a rabbi of the, Famous of the 20th century said, you know, when I used to go around to campuses and somebody would say to me, I'm a Catholic, I would know they were a Catholic. And somebody would say to me, when a student would say to me, I'm a Protestant, I'd know they were a Protestant. When a student said to me, I, I'm a human being, I knew they were a Jew. Mm -hmm. The escape of Jews from their own tradition is a constant and painful reality. And Chomsky is a, uh, is a particularly um, noxious example. Well, of course, I, again, I have to say that, you know, in, not in his defense, but I think it's mm -hmm. to his detriment. He's missed out. I on, agree. On yeah. an infinite wealth of interesting and delightful. Not only that, but I would have said nice things about him on your podcast. <laughs> <if only. laughs> well, I'll do, well, how about this? We'll do a, uh, we'll do a, a, a debate. How about a Rabbi sure. Wolpe Noam Chomsky debate? Sure. That would be, sure. that would be ratings gold, Rabbi. Uh, uh, I want to, I want to finish up with a couple of rapid fire questions. And I do want to okay. get to your book, Making a Lost Matter, which is such a meaningful book to me personally. Uh, first you. rapid fire question. What would you be doing if you weren't a rabbi? I think I would be an English professor. Okay, not second base for the Dodgers. Okay, fine. No, no, no. Because you have to, I, limited, limited by talent. No, when I grew up, I grew up in. I was born in Harrisburg. I was a Baltimore Orioles fan, actually. Ah, okay. Um, but but these days, Phillies, Eagles. Uh, anyway, I I don't I limited by talent i think what i what i would have done was become a writer and an english professor well wow, that proof you know yeah. what the proof is that the being a professor is the best job in the known universe rabbi it's that uh, neil armstrong after he landed on the moon the very first human being to ever set foot on another world he ended his career as a college professor at the university hey. of uh, i think dayton um there you go the bucket list. Have you ever heard of the bucket list? And sure. Yeah. So is that a Jewish concept? Is the bucket list something that, you know, a good Jew, you know, I once heard it said, you know, like some Talmud was asking his, uh, his rabbi at the yeshiva, you know, rabbi, is it okay if I ride a motorcycle? And the rabbi was like, right, you know, hit him upside the head. You know, basically it's not yes. like, riding a motorcycle is not a thing a Jew does. Well, is a bucket list something a Jew can do? I actually rode a motorcycle in Thailand when I was on my sabbatical. So that's off my bucket <laughs> list. Um, but I will tell you this, this is the closest thing I know to a Jewish version of the bucket list. Samson Raphael Hirsch was a great 19th century Orthodox rabbi, founder of modern Orthodoxy. Yeah. And late in his life, he told his students that he was going to go hiking in the Alps. And they said, Rabbi, what are you, you know, you're, yeah, I don't know, you're in his 80s, whatever. Why are you going hiking in the Alps? He goes, because I'm not going to be living that much longer. And I know after I die, I'm going to come before the Ribona Shalom the master of the universe. In other words, I'm going to come before God, God yeah. and God's going to say to me, so did you see my Alps? Mm. 
So I like that as a, you know, as an idea that there are certain things in the world that you should experience if you have the chance to, because it's a remarkable world. Is the multiverse and one incarnation of it, which is called the simulation hypothesis, which basically states that we're living in this immense digital simulation that's uh, promulgated by people deep in the future and simulating our existence. Is that compatible with Judaism? Again, it's, a, it's an offshoot of the multiverse, which composites that there's an infinite so, number of other universes. Is that compatible? There's with an that? early Midrash that says that God created many worlds before he created this one. So I suppose you could fit that into Judaism. Uh, I'm always reminded when people talk about a multiverse, that this is a simulation of Samuel Johnson and Barclay. Bishop Barclay was an idealist. He said everything exists in the mind. Hmm. And Samuel Johnson famously kicked a rock and said, I refute him thus. Um, <laughs> all I can say is, if this is a simulation, there, there is no evidence. I mean, I'm hitting the wall. I don't believe that this is, this is a creation of someone else's mind. Um, if I'm wrong, I'll be wrong later. But this is one of those cases where I think it might be that common sense is common sense. That's right. Why would there be so many Kardashians if there was a simulation? It, that's, there you go. <laughs> QED, okay. as the philosophers say. That's right, that's right. Um, last uh, couple of questions. Uh, what point in Jewish history would you most like to have been alive besides now? You, you can't say now because you're alive now, at least if the simulation hypothesis is not correct. Um, in order, in order not, not because I think it would be a nice time to be alive, but in order to answer the questions that I would like to have answered, um, since I wrote a brief biography of King David uh, called David, the Divided Heart in the Yale series of Jewish lives, um, I, I'm, in, I'm tremendously fascinated by the character of David. And boy, I would love to go back and, uh, and see him and see what his world was actually like. Uh, what is the uh, your 11th commandment? Um, it is what Henry James said was the most important thing in life. He said the three most important things in life are to be kind, to be kind, and to be kind. I think that is the, I think that is the critical. I, I don't always achieve it, but that's what matters. Wow. Yeah, that goes along with what my realtor once said, uh, location, location, location. Uh, exactly. Last couple of questions, Rabbi. Um, uh, if you could get rid of a commandment, if you could get rid of one of the, and you can't say adultery, Rabbi. <laughs> Okay. I'm joking. I'm joking, Rabbi. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> if you could get rid of a commandment, you know, Moses in the 10, what is it? The, uh, ah, the great Mel Brooks movie where he comes down with 15 commandments. He All right, exactly it. right. It gets rid of it. Which does one? It have to be, yeah. Does it have to be one of the 10 or can it be one of the 613? It could be one of the 613. Yeah, I know you, you know, the stepmother, you know, kind of the... Uh, uh, being attracted. No, I'm just kidding here with all these weird references. I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, I'm a vegetarian, so I would actually add to the commandments if I could. Oh, you would. Um, okay. So, yeah, right. I would say, I, I would say, uh, I would say either, either no meat or, or, or no factory farming, no matter how you slaughter them. Mm -hmm. Um, at least that if you're going to eat meat, at least know that the animals are not allowed to be treated cruelly while they are alive. Um, and, and there's too much wiggle room in some of the kosher laws and some of the kosher uh, and some animals that are kosher are, are not kosher uh, in terms of the suffering that they endure before they die. Mm -hmm. And yes. the last thing I want to just touch on is uh, is your book. Uh, I almost picked up a copy of my book, but I'll pick up a copy of your book here. This is Making Lost Matter. Very beautiful uh, paragraph at the end. Um, you say, when we read a book, the pages diminish. We can look ahead and see how far we ought to go. In that sense, no book can reproduce life because we know the terminus. Life does not grant that knowledge. The story could end today or in 50 years. Yet age is the visible sign of dwindling pages. Where once we had counted on unbounded future, now we begin to number the years. So the last question I want to ask you, Rabbi, is if you could take what one of my kids is working on called the never dying pill. If you could take a pill that would allow you to live forever, would you want to take it? If I was the only one to take it, no. Why not? No. Because I don't think that I would. I think that at a certain point, uh, it's like Tennyson's poem Tithonus. You know, me only cruel immortality consumes. I think if I consecutively lost everyone that I cared about and loved over and over and over again, the time would come when I would long for death. Very powerful, Rabbi. Um, 
Well, that's sort of more of a somber note that I wanted to end on. I was going to ask you a couple questions about uh, about chess uh, that we'll have to get to. Maybe we could do a part two and a part three with Noam Chomsky and then a right. part two. I'll take you out on Yom Kippur for a nice meal. Rabbi, thank you so much. Uh, you've been so gracious. Thank you, you've been, been such a big influence pleasure. in my life. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Uh, uh, happy holidays. Happy New Year. Shana Tova. Thank you. Bye-bye.